everything is on fire. But everyone I love is doing beautiful things and trying to make life worth living. And I know I don't have to believe in everything, but I believe in that. As some of you know, Nadia Boltz Weber is one of my favorite public theologians. She is a sober, heavily tattooed Lutheran minister. She's a former stand-up comic, which I love so much. And she's founder of a church in Denver called House for All Sinners and Saints. She is sometimes called the pastor of America's outsiders. I cannot think of a better title. She writes a weekly newsletter column, and in a relatively recent one, she wrote about how living in the world these past few years feels kind of like the wiring in her old apartment building. You can't plug too much in at one time or in one place or things just overload. And I was reminded of this uh, this week in the parish house when Cindy, our office administer, as we call her, reminded me not to plug the new coffee maker into the same plug as the microwave <laughs> and not to use them at the same time either. Well, here's how Nadia Boltz Weber describes the situation. I used to live in a very old apartment building with super sketchy electrical wiring, and were I to audaciously assume my hair dryer could run while the stereo was on, I'd once again find myself opening the gray metal fuse box and flipping the breaker. My building had been built at a time when there were no electric hair dryers, and the system shut down when modernity asked too much of it. She says, I think of that fuse box a lot because friends, I just do not think our psyches were developed to hold and feel and respond to everything coming at us right now. Every tragedy, injustice, every sorrow and natural disaster happening to every human being across the entire planet, the human heart and spirit were not made for this. So my emotional circuit breaker keeps overloading because my hardware was built for an older time. And yet, she says, when I check social media, it feels like there are always voices saying, if you aren't talking about or doing something about or posting about fill in the blank, then you are callous and privileged and part of the problem. And I'm always left wondering, am I doing enough? Am I giving enough? Am I saying enough about all the horrible things happening to think of myself as a good person? And the answer is always no. No, I am not. Nor could I, because no matter what I do, the goal of enough is just as, as, just as elusive as when I started. And yet doing nothing is hardly the answer. So I wanted to share something with you, she says. Every day of my life, I ask myself three questions. One, what's mine to do and what is not mine to do? Two, what's mine to say and what is not mine to say? And the third one is harder, three. What is mine to care about? And what is not mine to care about? Now, to be clear, that is not to say that those things are not worthy to be cared about by someone, only that my effectiveness cannot extend to every worthy thing to be cared about. It's not an issue of values. It's an issue 
of math. I think I would add to Nadia's assessment, it isn't just math. It isn't just math, it's an issue of wiring, human wiring. We have recently come through a global pandemic. It has only been 11 days since the last school shooting, this one in Winder, Georgia. And I confess to you, I might not have even known it had happened, but a member of my former congregation is a school teacher in that county. The war in Ukraine has not ended. In Gaza, healthcare, work, healthcare workers are trying to vaccinate children against polio while bombs fall. There was an article in the New York Times this week about the intense stress American parents are experiencing. So much so that the Surgeon General has designated it an urgent public health issue. I would tell parents to read it, but I know you're too busy. And as of yesterday, there were 62 large active wildfires burning across the country, being managed by what the fire industry calls full suppression strategies by 27,825 firefighters. These particular fires have already burned 2,485,326 acres. The world is on fire, literally and metaphorically. And then, of course, there is the election season with its roller coaster of hope and dread. We are not wired for this. Humans were made for villages. We were made for small communities. We were made to hold the sorrows and joys, the tragedies and dreams of a finite number of people. So it's no wonder that our fuses may be blowing up or shutting down or whatever it is that fuses do when you overload them. It isn't because we don't care. It's actually the opposite. It is because we do care. It is because we can imagine and feel the suffering of others. It is because we have such deep hopes for our country and our world. And we have this dream that something more beautiful, more just, more whole could be. So how are we going to survive and more than survive? How are we going to stay as well as possible in our souls during this time, whatever it brings? How do we answer those questions for ourselves? What is mine to do? What is mine to say? What is mine to care about? And what is not mine? As I wrote to one of you this week, I, do, I don't have the answers, would that I did. But I do have some ideas. I have some hopes and some beliefs. And I hope and believe that if we practice the things that we know help save us. Things such as compassion, courage, kindness, and generosity. We will get through this time in the life of our country and our world with our minds and hearts and spirits more or less intact. I believe that it matters where we place our attention it matters that we stay connected to communities where our hope is fed. 
I also believe it matters what we believe. It matters who we believe and what we believe in. Our theology matters, though we may not even think of ourselves as having one. It matters that we share our stories of strength and resilience with each other and that we look for ways to celebrate that strength and resilience. <clears throat> the worship committee knows I had all these other preaching plans for the fall, but I realized that what I want to talk about, what I need to talk about for the next two months is how we become and remain people who are doing beautiful things, people who are trying to make life worth living. And by beautiful things and things that make life worth, worth living, I don't mean big, dramatic, life-changing, world-changing actions. I don't think the poet does either. I think small. Think about making applesauce from the apples you pick and bringing a jar to your neighbors. That is a beautiful thing. Think about singing a child to sleep, watching their eyes flutter closed. That makes life worth living. Think about sending a poem to a friend, buying a cup of coffee for the stranger behind you in line. Think about letting yourself rest when you are tired, telling a hard truth that you or someone else needs to know. I told the kids earlier that Church is a life school. And if that is the case, our curriculum, our syllabus this fall will include these things. Number one, growing resilience, which is not just a personality trait. It's something we can learn, something that can get stronger. Number two, developing good theology. And by that, I mean theology that is life-giving. Number three, finding joy in the everyday. Number four, keeping our senses of humor because we know that laughter will save us like nothing else. Number five, becoming braver, knowing that courage looks different for each one of us. And finally, number six, maybe the hardest lesson, practicing, not perfecting, but practicing a radical respect for the people we most vehemently disagree with. This is not about whether or not anyone deserves our respect. It is because I'm pretty sure that treating people with contempt is bad for our souls. It's unfortunate, I know. There's a Hebrew word I've been thinking about a lot. It's tehila, the word tehila. It's commonly translated as songs of praise to God. The biblical book we call the Psalms is in Hebrew, tehillim, songs of praise. But the word tehillah comes from a root word that means to shine, to radiate, to reflect. And I want us to be asking and answering for ourselves. What do we want to shine with? What do we want to radiate and reflect into the world? There is a lot to worry about, and these things are quite worrisome. But I want to remind you that our worry 
does nothing except make us less well, less able to do those beautiful small things because worry takes away our capacity to radiate, to radiate hope and compassion. So instead of worrying, we're going to try to shine. This is Mary Oliver's poem called, I Worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Is my eyesight fading? Or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, and I gave it up. And I took my old body and went out into the morning and sang.